Well, good evening. How are you this evening? You're good. That's what I'm going to assume. You're good. The sun's shining, so you're happy like me, right? I, uh, I would like to think that I can rise above all things, and it turns out I can rise above a fair number of them, but much easier in the sunshine, right? Just, it's just a better version of me when the sun is shining out there. And so I'm thankful for this beautiful day that we've had and, uh, and these, uh, these incredible sunsets. And I'm grateful that I get to spend the tail end of my day with all of you. <clears throat> and one more time, I just want to thank you for letting me be one of your pastors. Because um, I know that somewhere there is a mental health professional taking notes saying, Cliff, you are, um, you are not your work. But I'm just going to tell you that I, it, it feels very much to me like, like one of the main reasons that I get to be on the planet taking up resources is that I was born to preach and teach the gospel. And so every chance that I get to do that, I will say yes. And uh, that you all give me the opportunity to do that twice a week is a great blessing in my life. <clears throat> Years ago, I uh, was granted a much-needed sabbatical. And it was 10 weeks of just rest and recovery. And I needed it. And my family and I will always, always be thankful that, <clears throat> that our denomination recommends that after seven years of continuous service in one church, that the church grant the pastor uh, a sabbatical. And uh, we were in Whitefish for, I think, eight years, something like that, when we took, when we took the sabbatical. But here's what I found out. As much as I needed the rest, I also found out that I need to preach. Uh, by the end of it, I just felt like preaching is air. And so I was, the, the sabbatical was good because I got to rest, but I was ready to go. And uh, one of the things that, that I've enjoyed about us um, as, as time has gone by and we've been able to open up the church a little more and open up the, little, the church a little more, you know, compared to when I first got here, is now instead of once a week standing behind a camera hoping you guys are watching it three days later, uh, I get to be with you all, and I get to preach and teach live a couple of times a week. So thank you for, for coming. I know this isn't about me. It's not. But, um, but it blesses my heart that I get to, to preach and teach. Why don't we start by asking God's blessing on all of that, shall we? Lord, as we uh, gather in this place tonight, we do want to say thank you. <clears throat> this uh, past year has uh, taught us to be very grateful for that and to no longer take it for granted. As we are here tonight, Lord, we are going to apply ourselves to the, the study of your word and these concepts that emerge from your word. And so I pray uh, two things. One, that your Holy Spirit would come upon me in power so that what the folks receive tonight isn't just eh, it cliffs best, but that it's your Holy Spirit working through me to proclaim the word of truth. And I pray that your same spirit would uh, open the hearts and the minds of everybody who's listening, the folks who are joining us live and the folks who are joining us by live stream. But you've done this, Lord, billions of times now, billions of times as Christians have gathered together and said, let's look to your word. Your spirit has come and taken that book, made it living and active and poured it into to our lives. So we ask you uh, tonight with, with confidence that you'll do it. With faith in Jesus' name, amen. All right, salt, seven areas of life training. We, we took a look at uh, the spiritual aspect of life, the psychological aspect of life, the social or relationships aspect, and now we're, we're on week three of the, of the physical aspect. And I noticed none of you brought, you know, like your, your workout mats or any of that stuff because you've been here for the first couple of weeks and you remember this is not an exercise class. I see none of you brought your... Um, brought your, your cooking gear, nor your Weight Watchers books, uh, and I don't have a scale up here for you to stand on because this isn't a diet or a weight loss class either. What this is, is a chance for us to take a look um, at the physicality of our bodies uh, through the lens of the scriptures and see what it is that God intended for us. Oh no, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> Cliff is, uh, it's awesome to have him here. He, Laura, and the whole family. Uh, what a blessing he is. 
This guy, I don't know if you know how much he, he plays the drums. He does. He's in that sound booth. Uh, for, you're 16 tomorrow? 16-year-old young man. Uh, holy cow. He does the work of 10 people. Right. So uh, uh, both extreme blessings. So here we go. Join me. Happy birthday. Here we go. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> no, a happy birthday to you, pal. <laughs> you know, there's some times when you're on the train tracks, you can see the train coming, you just can't get out of the way, right? <laughs> John, thanks a bunch. So, <laughs> seven areas of life training. We're talking about physicality tonight, and uh, we are on uh, week three of that, which is titled Body and Soul. But to kind of make sure that, uh, that we connect all the pieces of the puzzle tonight, I want to go back and draw two of the diagrams that are really foundational to this, this whole thing. And the first one is that very first week of salt, that very first uh, diagram that helps us set the whole created order uh, in order so that we can, we can uh, use that as foundational to our understanding. God is a triune being, three, uh, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he created how many things? All things. That's right. He created all things. And because he created all things, he has certain rights or an exclusive domain to uh, at least three things that we've talked about over the course of this time. Uh, we have said that, uh, I guess that created in the uh, proper diagram is supposed to go right up here, okay, right here, but I'm just going to draw it out to the side. He created all things. And this gives him um, three uh, exclusive rights. What are those three rights? Okay, he has the power to what? Power to control. Do you have the power to control? No. You, unfortunately, have the power, just enough power to try to control. And just so you know, every time that you get frustrated by trying to control someone else and not being able to really get it done, just know that they're equally frustrated that you are trying to control them and doing it poorly. All right? We have power to, he has the power to control. Uh, what's, what's this middle one right here? He has the right to judge, doesn't he? Yeah, and it's, um, we've, got to, we've got to remember the difference between power and, and right or authority. This one is positional, right? He has the authority. He has the spot in the, in the authority structure. This one, he's got the dynamite. He's got the strength, the explosive power to actually get the job done. And then what's this one over here? Praise. He has the right to how much praise? Praise. All praise. Yeah. Does he get all the praise? No, that's part of the problem. And why doesn't he get all of the praise? It's because he created human beings uh, kind of like him. And so human beings, once they rebelled against God, all of the things that were like God got kind of a half twist to them so that we have this distorted understanding that says, hey, I'm not just like God. I'd kind of like to be the God, at least the God of me. And so we try to do things. We try to control. And we assume the right to judge. What's the problem with trying to judge? I don't know nearly as much as I think I do. And I already know that I don't know everything. Right? I already know that I don't know everything. But I don't know half as much as I think I do about you, your motives, and all of the situations that, that brought you to the place of the decisions in your life. So am I a very accurate judge? Mm -mm. Am I a very fair judge? No. Am I a just judge? Cannot be just if I don't, if I don't have all the information, right? Okay. Uh, but fortunately, even though I try to control and I assume the right to judge, I'm perfectly humble, so I never seek any praise. Oh, wait a minute. That's right. I'm always seeking praise. Look what I've done. Look at me. Hmm. But uh, there was another man. His name was Jesus, and uh, he came, 
and he lived sinlessly among us. And uh, because of that, instead of trying to judge, what did he do? He trusted the, or instead of trying to control, he trusted the Father. Remember that? I don't have to control things. Why? Because God's in control. I trust my Father. So he trusted God instead of trying to control. John, I can't, you read John. I can't tell you how many times I've read John's gospel. And in it, Jesus says, if any man receives my word and does not obey, I do not judge him. That is so not the way he was supposed to answer that. No, not the way he was supposed to finish the question. It just makes sense. He's the God. If anyone receives my word and does not obey, gavel, please. Right? Jesus says, I don't judge him. He refuses to judge. Why would he refuse to judge? Talk to me about that. What do you think? Why would he refuse to judge? You can't look this up in your book. It's not, it's not in there. Why would he refuse to judge? tell you one reason. It's because he trusted God. He trusts that God, judge is about trying to bring about justice. Jesus said, I'm going to trust that the God of this universe will eventually bring about justice. Was Jesus himself trying to bring about justice? He was trying to bring about mercy. Oh, maybe we should just camp out there for a little bit tonight. You know why Jesus didn't run around judging? He wasn't trying to execute justice. If you get justice, you get penalized. He wasn't trying to bring penalties. He was trying to bring mercy and grace and relief from the dread of being judged. Somebody should probably say hallelujah and get blessed about that. Because that's the good news of the gospel right there, people. Right? Mm, good stuff. Did he seek praise? No. Nope. He just uh, kind of made sure that all that praise ended up getting deflected to the Father because he also trusted the Father who would one day sort all of that out and make it right. Do you think Jesus is getting praise right now? Oh yeah, that's what we do every single Sunday and every time we get together, we talk about how great he is. And the scriptures tell us that at some point in the future, every knee, how many knees? Yeah, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And then I love this, this formula, in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth. <laughs> I'm not sure where those people are hanging. In heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, will every tongue, every knee, will proclaim that he's Lord. That's fantastic. Okay, this is where we started, right? And um, I can see already Gene Killian that I missed a spot with my WD-40 after, after you taught me. Huh? Yeah, I know. It's, it's terrible. So I may need, I may need your um, tutorial after we're, you know, after we're done tonight. Let's take a look at another diagram, all right? This diagram, uh, we've looked at it often as well, and it's the diagram um, of the human person. So how many parts to the human person? Three. Somebody uh, call them out to me. What are they? Spirit is on the left. What's the one in the middle? Soul. What's the one on the right? Body. Okay. Body or flesh. So we're going to draw those. We've got spirit here. Soul here. And we've got body here. Uh, each of body. Okay. Um, Three components to the soul. What are the three components of the soul? We've got our thinker. What's that? Mind. We've got our feelers. What's that? Emotions. Yeah, we've got our decider. What's that? Will. Yeah. Now, some things that you, that you may have forgotten, but that you need to know is that before you come to know Christ, the Scriptures say you are dead in your sins. And yet you notice that you're up and walking around and doing things, Right? So does it mean that absolutely all of you is dead? No. But there is something in you that is dead, dead. I mean, dead, dead. And here's what it is. Your spirit. But this uh, is not the only part of you that is dead. Have you noticed that your body seems to think that it is either dead or dying? Uh-huh. If you haven't realized that already, it's coming. Just so you know. All right? It's coming. Your body is at some point going to start showing you some of the signs of mm, health and vitality in life waning instead of waxing, right? But there's also this, this thing that happens in your soul, and some part of your soul seems to be dead or dead-ish, and in particular, it's your will. 
Have you, have you ever noticed, do, you, do any of you have a memory of your life before Christ where you literally seemed powerless to your sin? That no matter how many times you woke up regretting whatever you had done, that you just went right back to it. And the scriptures say like, like a pig returns to its wallow or a dog returns to his vomit. You remember that part of your life? Yeah, your will, no matter how many times you said willpower, it, it just wasn't enough. What the scriptures teach is that when the resurrection life of Jesus Christ is administered to us, our spirits come alive for the very first time. There is an aspect to life that we had never before experienced, a whole new dimension to our humanity. It also tells us that our will is now, um, engage, it's now brought to life, given spiritual life, and works in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, with God, who comes into, not just remains outside, comes into us, and he now, he now affects our spirit, but he also gives strength to our will so that you can decide to obey him. You are not bound over to disobedience any longer. So when you have said in the past, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, that's who you used to be. You used to be a sinner that was saved by grace. And now, the, the, the consistent terminology in the New Testament is hagioi, holy ones. You are the ones who are holy, and you're set apart, and being made holy. And you, by the power of God's Holy Spirit within you, and this new living will, are able to choose to obey Him. So we don't get to blame our sins on the devil, or on our parents, or on the person who made me mad. I get to decide by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. But I've got this flesh. So he's, he, he brings this back to life. He engages this. Oh, he also does some things for my mind. Instead of a darkened and confused mind, he now gives me light from the Scriptures and from his Holy Spirit so that my thinking can get straightened out. I can now believe the truth instead of lies. And I can now act upon truth instead of lies. And when you act upon truth instead of lies, you find your life being blessed. How many have experienced that financially, right? When you started following what the scriptures teach, the truth about money, it just changed some things in your life, didn't it? Yeah. There's lots of other things too. We're going to talk about that tonight. Here's where God and I argue. I just, I just tell him, man, you brought, you brought my spirit back to life. I mean, I'm like really alive now. This has changed. I now have power over sins that once owned me. My mind seems to be pretty clear. I'm not confused often. I almost always know what to do in any given moment. And if I don't, I turn to him and ask. And by the end of my prayer, I'm able to make a decision and go. He has clarified my mind. I'm very grateful for that. Emotions, still kind of like a soup sandwich, you know, kind of messy. But here's where I, I, can, I can deal with that. But here's where I argue with him. You put some life in here, you put some life in here, but my body still keeps... Mm. Not only is it headed to the grave, but have you noticed how it also still has some desires that don't fit with having a spirit that's filled with his Holy Spirit? Do you notice that about you? I mean, you don't have to like stand and tell us what they are, but do you recognize that in you? That... That sometimes you want too much food, you want too much sleep, you want too much, or, 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 a, or a twisted, perverted kind of something that's poisonous to us. You notice that about you? That's where I argue with God. You're sanctifying this, you're sanctifying this. How come this is bound over to death? Well, he, uh, he, helps, he helps me understand. He helped me understand something this week. I can't tell you how many times I've taught this, and something clicked for me tonight. This actually earlier today as I was studying. He said, Cliff, I have not left your body completely bound over to death. Now, I'm telling you, I've taught this a bunch of times, and tonight, today, the lights came on. So I'm going to show you something that I think you are going to appreciate and that I think is going to help you experience some freedom. Remember last week when we talked about the uh, kinds of the areas of our lives where uh, God has given us freedom but then if we, if we decide to presume upon that freedom and go beyond it, that we end up not freer, but in bondage. Yeah, it's something along those lines. Okay? So let's, uh, let's talk tonight about the body and the soul and the, uh, the connection between the body and the soul. We're not going to talk about the spirit much tonight. We're going to talk about the body and the soul. And in particular, how the soul and how we operate our souls ends up affecting our bodies. Uh, let's, let's look at the, the kind of the, the theme scripture for this is 
Fix your thoughts. Oh, it's Philippians 4.8. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Here's, here's something that I would like all of the Christians to say out in public. We're just, you know, you're eating, you're, you're eating dinner in a restaurant because you can now. You're uh, going to the gym because you can now. You're, you're going to school because you can now. You're going to your work because you can now. Here's something that I think that the Christians could do that would not be contentious. It wouldn't be, you know, dragging religion into the workplace. By the way, I'm okay with you dragging religion in the workplace. Um, it would just be this kind of light and leavening influence. If you would just talk and encourage people to be honorable, which is, isn't about us. It's about actually viewing others as worthy of being treated with dignity. How about that? How about if we didn't even argue about Jesus in the culture anymore? How about if, if all of the people just said, what if, what if we just acted honorably? Because I thought that John Killian was worthy of being treated with dignity. How about that? Don't even have to know whether he's a Christian or not. Don't have to know how he lives. Don't have to know his, his thought life. How about I just treat him with dignity? Hmm? If I treat him with dignity, then I'm acting honorably. Hmm. Paul said, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Why? Was Paul just making a rule about all the things that you're supposed to think about now? No, remember, rules were never the point. Rules were, help to, were the path, the roadmap to get us to the place of blessing where God can, can pour out the fullness of his, uh, fullest expression of his love to us. What Paul's telling us is that what you think, and remember, your thinker is in what part of the human, human uh, the, the human? It's in the soul, right, exactly. What you think in your soul has an influence on your body. Now, just for those of you who might be panicking and wondering if I'm going to talk about the power of positive thinking, let me just put you at ease. Yes, I am. Okay? Yes, I am. But we're going to talk about it through a scriptural lens. Okay? What you think in your soul has an influence on your body. Your soul is made up of mind, will, and emotions. And your will is the part of you that chooses what you do, including choosing what you think. Now, I'm going to tell you my experience has been and my, my belief has been that I'm not the only one who has access to my head. I intentionally think some thoughts, but I know there is a tempter and an accuser who also whispers in my ear. And if I am not careful, if I am not diligent, if I am not um, purposely being alert, I will sometimes not recognize his voice, and I'll just believe that lie. I'll just take it right into my head, and I will think it right alongside all of Cliff's great ideas. Oh, and the other source of ideas, which is what? God's Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you one more source. You ready? His Holy Word. Right. So let's just line them up here. We've got his Holy Spirit. We've got his Holy Word. We've got my mind, which is being renewed, sanctified, day by day, and we've got the voice of the evil one. Do you see for, for the, the followers of Jesus, if we've got, the, uh, if we've got, we've got Satan's voice, we've got my sanctified mind, we've got the Word, and we've got the Holy Spirit, you tell me, which direction is the deck stacked? Which direction is the deck stacked? Toward my success, toward my life, or toward my failure, my death and destruction? You can do the math. It's three to one, y'all. It's three to one. We all, he has given us what we need right here for the, for the thinker part of us to engage and start leading at least the thinking part of us toward life. Let's see uh, what effect that thinker part might have on the rest of us. I'm hoping somebody saw that tonight and for the first time felt hopeful. Like, like the things that run around inside your head, like, like the doubts and the fears and the worries and the depression. I hope, I hope that when you saw those four things up there tonight, maybe for the first time in your life, you felt a little bit of hope. Like, like maybe you and God and his word could gang up on the enemy and give you a little bit of relief and a little bit of hope and a little bit of joy and a little bit of peace. 
It's possible, isn't it, Leroy? It's possible, absolutely. What you think in your soul has an influence on your physical body. Your will is the part of what to to do, including what to think. What you think about is what the scriptures refer to as having your mind set upon, okay? You, you, let me ask you this, from your past, maybe your present, do you see any connection between what you think and how you feel? Yeah. Well, if not, maybe just uh, ask yourself uh, or, or answer these questions. When you think about politics, do you go away feeling like, oh man, whew, so it's just a joyful, happy day? Oh, only for four years at a time, you know, and then the other guy wins. How about this? When you think of the death of a loved one, do you spring up out of your chair afterwards and just think, oh man, I'm, I feel like I'm in better shape than I was before I got started mourning? No, instead, you, typically after we think about the loss of a loved one, not only do we emotionally feel sad, but we feel tired, right? Unmotivated. Yeah. Uh, if you remain in grief for too long, we've measured these things. We find out that there are major diseases that you become more susceptible to if you don't process through grief. Help me out, Leroy. Nod your head if I'm telling the truth and do it this way if I'm just making this stuff up, right? It's the truth. Uh, how about this? When you think about your favorite vacation, how does your body feel? All of a sudden, I'm joyful, and uh, I, I feel healthier, I feel happier, I feel like, maybe let's go for a walk. Hey, maybe let's sit down and, and plan our next vacation, and, and with uh, an increased heart rate and deeper breathing, you're, you're flipping through the pages of the whatever to, I mean, there's a, real, there's a real connection between what you think and how you feel. How about this? Can you remember the birth of a child? Oh, Listen. I could not fly before my children were born, but on the day the first one came along, I didn't hit the ground for about a week after that, right? I mean, I, I, was, a, I was a father. I didn't feel like a little kid anymore. I felt like I'd finally come into my, my maturity and my manhood. I was scared to death, but I felt like I'd come into my maturity and my manhood. I, I walked three inches taller because of the joy that I felt in my heart over the birth of my son. And I'll tell you what, Lori didn't get to see him for the first three and a half hours because she had had some problems. And so they took her away, and I I, I was left with that little boy and not knowing how my wife was doing for three and a half hours. That's a weird place to be caught. And when they wheeled her back into the room, my strength returned. My physical strength returned to me. That nausea that I felt that was gnawing at me, gone! Yeah. What you think will affect in many ways how you feel. Well, the Bible describes for us two mindsets, and you can set your mind on one of the two. You can, and we've studied this uh, before in one of the, one of the previous uh, sections on psychology. You can either set your mind on what God wants, on the Spirit, or you can set your mind on what the world wants, what the Bible may re- refers to as kind of these two bedfellows who uh, are in, in kind of a conspiracy against you, your flesh and the world around you. And when the Bible uses the word flesh, uh, Christians, some Christians want to argue about what that means. Because some people think it means this, you know, the skin, bone, flesh, um, organs, all of that. And some people say, no, 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 no. It's talking about your sinful nature. And I want to be the guy, I'm a middle child, so I'm a peacemaker. And uh, I want to be the guy who steps in between the two of them and says, you're both right. Because I think the scripture is talking about the lower desires, those twisted, polluted things that we talked about, that, that how, how humanity got given a half twist that just has it off kilter all the time. So that you have an appetite for more food than you need, an appetite, you know, right, increased appetites for all kinds of things, and not strong enough appetites for other things. But there is something also that is beyond our physicality. There is something bound up in this fallen flesh that's that, that, that is beyond just an animal, right? It is our lower desires, but it's also the case that about the time that you lose your physical, if, if, if I read the Bible correctly, about the time that you lose your physical body, you're set free from a whole bunch of lower earthly desires. So that tells me it's talking about literally the body, but also this thing that we call the flesh or fleshly desires. 
So the Bible tells us we got these two mindsets. Set your mind on what God wants, on the spirit, on what, or you can set your mind on what the world wants, the, um, the world and your flesh, which kind of team up and tend to agree on sinful kind of appetites. So here's, uh, we're going to start our new diagram tonight. So we're going to have this uh, big circle here that we're going to call our mindset. Right? Mindset is just what you choose to think about. And the, your, your mindset, that whole thing is determined in which part of the human person? The soul. That's right. That's right. In the soul. Okay. And we can have a mindset that is... You, know, you get the, the symbolism of the directions, right? So the one that heads upward we will refer to as the spirit, because it's positive, and the one that is uh, headed in uh, the direction of destruction or downward we will call the flesh. So I'll argue with the uh, curriculum that says the flesh isn't your skin and bones. I would say it's, it's not just your skin and bones. Since the fall of, of the human race, when we rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden, it, uh, it is the selfish desire inside of each person to have what he or she wants without God. That's probably a pretty good description of the sinful nature or what, the, what we, we sometimes call the flesh. It's the desire inside of each person to have everything that he or she wants and without God. Why without God? So that I can get the glory for all that I've accomplished and attained and possessed for myself. And also, so he can't tell me no if he doesn't approve of it. Right? It's the selfish desire inside of each person to every, have everything he or she wants without God. Christians and non-Christians have flesh, okay? Both the meat and the tendons, but also some desires that are unholy. The Bible describes the fallen flesh as wanting your way, wanting everything for yourself, and wanting to appear important. Or what's, what, what's another way that we could refer to wanting to appear important? Seeking praise. Oh, I see where this connects to the previous lessons. Listen to this. This is a, uh, this is a paraphrase. It's not a direct word-for-word -word translation of, of the original text of the Bible, but this is a, a pretty good working person's understanding of that text. It's 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, and here's what he says, this is what's going on in the world. Wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important. At practically everything that goes on in the world has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity Man, I'm telling you, I sometimes struggle with some of the paraphrases of the Bible. That one I love. <laughs> it really just drills down and hits the point really hard. The Bible teaches that when your focus is on the flesh, this, this lower desire, it brings you down and it ends up leading to negative consequences. However, when your focus is on the spirit, there in the upper quadrant of our diagram, you will end up experiencing a lift and you will thereby experience peace. Romans 8, 6 says it, for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is two things, life and peace. See, I'm telling you, it's you, you, just basic math will help you be a better informed Christian. You can either get one for the money, but it's going to lead you to death, or you can get two for the money, it's going to lead you to life and peace. Not just existence. Existence and a peaceful one. Uh, Laura is a bargain shopper. I already know which one she wants. Two for the money, right? Bible teaches that when you focus on the flesh, it brings you down. When you focus on the spirit, it brings you up. Notice uh, the, the, in, the, in the diagram that your mindset, whether it is set on the spirit or on the flesh, is going to affect your body. In, in time, it will produce some form of life or death, okay? So this, if you have your mind set on the spirit, it's going to do certain things to your body. And if you have your mind set on the flesh, it's going to do certain other things. You are uh, going to experience life. 
or you're going to experience death. And that little circle is the circle from the diagram body, right? From the, from the human person diagram that we learned very early and that we looked at earlier tonight. If your mind is set on your flesh, okay, on, on the body itself and also on its corrupted desires... If your mind's set on the flesh, it can result in a whole, uh, whole big goal collection of negative things, such as depression, fear, anxiety. Um, I, I can keep shopping for you if you want more of those things, but those are probably enough to discourage us from going that direction, right? These emotions then have this incredible ability to ripple throughout the soul, the soul, remember, mind, will, and emotions. The thinker, the feeler, and the decider. If you set your thinker on something, it is, the other parts of your soul are going to be affected. So your feeler and your decider are also going to be impacted. These emotions ripple through your soul, but guess what? They also ripple through your body. We have come to realize that the human organism and the human mind even, not just the brain, the organ, but the mind itself is this incredible conductivity and there is electrochemical pulse moving causing everything that happens in you and to you when you do this it's because there was an electrochemical uh, uh, signal or energy in your brain that found its way down a nerve path out to your arm and you went like this by the way when you went like this it wasn't because no more neuroelectrical impulse. It's because a whole nother neuroelectrical impulse said, relax, Cliff. They're not impressed with your guns. Down it came. That was a joke. That did, Laura, my jokes. We're going to have to get a sign. That, oh, they gave me the thumbs down? Good grief, dear. Yeah. Listen, there is real energy. This isn't Cliff becoming Eastern mystical on you. This is, uh, this is just reality. We can actually measure that there is electrochemical impulse. There's electricity happening inside of your body. And it connects the, br the brain part of you and the mind that is somehow linked to that brain and all of the rest of the physical organs of the body. And when you set your mind on the flesh... It can result in feelings of depression, fear, and anxiety, but can also do some things to the organs of the body. If you keep stuffing a bunch of electrochemical energy into anything and you don't let it have a healthy outlet, guess what happens? It burns its way out. So we have found that humans experience stress as electrochemical energy. And if you keep storing it up and keep storing it up and keep storing it up, it works like the blinker light on your car, okay? Your blinker light works like it does, and so does the, uh, the windshield wipers because they have an electrical component in there called a capacitor. And a capacitor is like a battery with a gate, okay? It stores up energy. It's got this little mechanism that charges it, so it stores up energy, but the gate opens whenever it gets to X amount of energy, and when the gate comes open, all of the energy comes out. And then the gate slams shut and the charger starts up and it charges again. When that capacitor, that battery reaches its fullest, gate comes open, boom, all the energy comes out. Guess what? Every part of your body is a capacitor. And you are under stress of good kinds and bad kinds all of the time. But if you fix your mind on the flesh, not only do you have some feelings that are affected. Not only is your decider affected, but your body is affected. And if you keep just cramming stress into it and you don't find any healthy way for that to come out, one of these days, the gate is gonna fly open and what the doctor will say to you is, we hope you survive your heart, atta your heart attack or your stroke or your cancer or this general malaise and disease that we can't lay our we, 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 can't, we can't find a diagnosis for it. I'm sorry, you're just dying. Hmm. The fleshly motivation for what you do will typically be rooted in one of these three things. Okay? The fallen flesh is driven by a desire to control life and other people, by a tendency to judge yourself and others, and a desire to be praised and accepted by others. And when you focus your mind 
on those things, on the flesh, on those, those desires, you are going to inevitably start this descent toward not only mental emotional death, not only spiritual death, but you are going to hasten the descent of your body to the grave. Flesh wants to control, to judge, and to, pra- and to uh, get praise. Wants. I can't even spell tonight. There we go. It's a well-worn path, by the way. Almost everybody walks it. Almost everybody walks the path to destruction. Uh, Jesus said the, the, the way out of this is narrow, steep, and very few people find it. So this is the well-worn path. If you'd like to get on it, just wander around on your own or just um, get a, as far away from the people of God as you can and you'll, you'll find a group that'll, that'll help you find the trailhead and find your way there. The desire to be in control to judge and to seek praise will lead to certain kinds of decisions. If those things are your motives, if you, if, you, if you fix your mind on those things, they are going to cause you to make certain kinds of decisions. And all of these decisions have negative consequences. Now I want to show you this long list of negative consequences in your life if you set your mind on the flesh. Okay? In, in time, your mind, which is set on the flesh, could lead to one of many physical consequences in the body, such as um, illnesses, sexual diseases, chemical dependency, eating disorders, the, the compulsive desire to disfigure your body, abortion, suicide. All of these things come from focusing our minds on the desires of the flesh, trying to control your life, trying to control others, judging or, or wanting to judge yourself and others, seeking praise and approval from others. Listen, it's exhausting it, if you appoint yourself as the judge of everybody around you, if you have to judge their politics, if you have to judge how clean they keep their house, if you have to judge how well they make their kids behave, if you have to judge how well they take care of their lawn, if you have to judge how well they're, uh, they're, they're uh, whatever, you are going, it is a full-time job because there's an unlimited number of people for you to judge, Right? It's going to wear you out, and it will lead to stress. And stress has been proven to lead or to cause very real physical and medical problems in the body. Ulcers, you can get those, right? You're not born with them, but you can get them if you walk the the path to uh, follow in the flesh there. High blood pressure, headaches, we know all of these things are connected with stress. Not all sickness and disease is caused by what's going on in your soul, however, because we do live in a with a fallen body in a fallen world, with the promise of both of those things one time, you know, in the future, getting new ones. Much of it, uh, of, of illness, does have a physical or, or um, a biological root, uh, but there's a lot of evidence in the medical community that points to real illness and even disease being caused by what goes on in the soul. And guess what? The scriptures told us that long time ago, before there was the practice of modern medicine. Uh, David wrote it in a song that he wrote, Psalm 38.3, my whole body is sick. My health is broken because of my sins. And he's not talking there about God punishing him. He's saying, my sins caused brokenness in my body. When you can't control things, question for you, do you get angry? Being angry isn't healthy. Listen, can can I help you with one thing as your pastor? The next time that somebody starts talking about Jesus cleansing the temple, can we all just make a a decision in the here and now that we're not going to use Jesus cleansing the temple to justify all of our own sinful anger? And when you're honest with yourself, the times when you get rip-roaring mad, is it really really caused by a righteous love for God? Or is it most often because I just didn't get what I want? Anger isn't healthy. And it's why the scriptures many, 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 many times dissuade us from going there. Do you judge and compare yourself to others? This behavior can lead to jealousy. Jealousy is destructive too. 
Proverbs 14.30, a sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. It'll rot you from the inside out. Anybody know a bitter old person that you can see? It's just, I mean, they're, you know what I'm talking about? Anybody see a bitter young person that looks 30 years older than they ought to? It's killing them. Envy can lead to physical illness. Check this out. Proverbs 27.4, anger is cruel, wrath is like a flood, those are both bad things. But who can survive the destructiveness of jealousy? There's something that's far worse than that, right? Jealousy and envy. Destructive. Looking for it. It didn't say that it's just it's a sin. It's naughty. You shouldn't do it. So it's going to kill you. Looking for love in the form of praise, approval, acceptance from others can lead you to all kinds of things. Listen, you guys know where I'm going with this, where the curriculum's going with it. What, do you, what, what are we all worried about with our daughters particularly if they do not get the praise, approval, and acceptance of their fathers? What do we, what do we assume they are at, uh, at great risk of if they don't get those things? They're going to find them in inappropriate premature sexual relationships outside of marriage. You know this, right? You listen, you should fear for that for your sons too. Instead of baptizing what boys do. Say amen. Okay. When you violate God's design in that area of your life, you are going to hurt yourself. It's interesting. The Apostle Paul says all other sins are outside of the body. That one you sin against you. When, when you violate what God taught about sexuality, that's a sin against you. You bringing about your own destruction and death. When you violate God's design for you, you hurt yourself. And a physical consequence of this could be anything from uh, sexual disease to sexual dysfunction within your marriage. So 1 Corinthians tells us our bodies were not made for sexual immorality. They don't work right when you do it immorally. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. You can say amen to that too. The same pain and the reality of stress that leads to some illnesses in the body can also lead people then to try to self-medicate, right? I, don't, I, 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 I feel the dis-ease, the unhealth, because I've, I've focused my mind on the flesh. And instead of repenting, turning to God, and seeking the real remedy of the things, what do we look for? Just a little bit of relief. Just a little bit of relief. And so we turn to things like alcohol and drugs, caffeine, or, or any kind of chemical substance. And that, that use can quickly, as you know, lead to dependency and addiction when they're relied upon over and over. And now all of a sudden, they aren't the relief. They feel like one more heaviness to you. And that's why Paul told the Ephesians, don't be drunk with wine. It'll ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill and control you. Seeking praise and approval from others and not from God in the physical area of life can lead you to make another kind of poor decisions, like poor choices in the area of eating. If you think that you have to look a certain way or be a certain weight in order to be accepted, beautiful, valuable, we know where that goes, right? Eating disorders. You may, uh, on the other end of this, say, I just want comfort, so what do I do? I eat comfort food, and you begin eating large amounts of food and of foods that are not good for you, and, and all of this is done either to pursue acceptance from other people seeking praise, right, or to comfort my own self because I don't think much of me, and I'm trying to either make myself praiseworthy or cover up for the fact that I'm not. I want to feel like I don't feel like I feel So I, I look for something that can't really comfort me. This kind of control that we give ourselves over to is driven by a desire to be accepted or noticed or valued by others or by ourselves. So Proverbs 31 says, charm's deceptive, beauty doesn't last. But then it speaks about, it's, this is in the context of speaking of a woman. It says, but a woman who fears, rightfully respects the Lord, trusts Him, will be what? Greatly praised. Oh, get that. She doesn't even have to seek it. She doesn't seek praise because she gives that to God, right? But if she is rightly related to Him, it's amazing what happens. Everybody praises the women that live their lives in obedience to God. 
Everybody looks at, listen, all of the men in the world look at the women who are following hard after God, and they look at them through a different lens than they look at other women. You know, so do the women, you know. Judging your looks based on the appearance of the people around you or the people you see on television and the movies and magazines, whatever, that can lead you to make wrong decisions for your body. It may lead you to disfigure your body in an attempt to look like whoever. And again, this behavior is probably rooted in the desire for praise and acceptance or approval. Listen to what Paul said to the Corinthians. We read it last week too. The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to you. God owns the whole works, so let people see God in and through your body. Let me just ask you a quick question. Who's better at everything, you or God? You know, if you really believed that it was God, we would quit messing with a lot of the things that he made. And I understand that there are some things that, that, um, that, that can be properly corrected by surgery. I get that. They're... they're um, for, for instance, I know a number of women who have had breast reductions because their backs hurt all of the time. Okay, not, not everything works in this fallen world the way that it should, right? But, but we, when we look at the human body, we have to start with the assumption, with the assumption that, that God made us the way that he wanted us. We can then also consider the fact that in a fallen sinful world, sometimes... God's, per, God's will doesn't work out perfectly, right? But if my desire is measured on wanting to be like this person, that person, or that person so that I'll get loved more, hmm. that's where we're talking about the kinds of things that pollute the mind and distort the love of God and cause us to then disfigure the body that the Lord has made. The attempt to control the course of one's life could lead to a decision Here's one of the decisions that we'll, you'll hear me talk about from, from time to time repeatedly because I think it's a plague and a scourge in our land. If you think that you have to control you and you have the absolute right to control you, that's how people make the decision to get abortions. Having an abortion will not only bring physical consequences to the body, but it also leads to the death of another body that God created. Suicide. Thoughts of it are based on the desire to control life. And if life isn't going to go like I want, then I'm not going to do life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who is given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. All these problems are in one way or another, an illness, a disease, or an abuse of the body. Okay. Illness plus abuse plus disease is going to add up to death if you just give it enough time. Pride, vanity, trying to control. Judging. Those are all ways that your flesh is trying to be God. It's trying to exalt itself. And when you attempt to be God, you will bring about the death of your body. Why? Because you are trying to do something you were never built to do. You don't have the authority. You do not have the power either. And if ultimately you are trying to run the universe or your little corner of it with insufficient horsepower. You ever seen, you, you've seen the, uh, the, the, the picture from Greek mythology, right, of Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill? They should have made a movie of that instead of a, a, pic, instead of a, a book with just a still shot, because I'll tell you what happens. Sooner or later, he loses his footing, and the rock rolls over the top of him and squashes him. And that's what happens when you try, it's the, the picture of him pushing the whole world up, right? You, you, you try to push the whole world up, you try to be the God who determines how the world's going to go sooner or later, because you don't have the horsepower nor the wisdom, you're going you're gonna to slip. And that thing's going to come rushing back on you, and it's going to bring about your own death. So what's the uh, remedy You've got to turn from the direction that you are headed. And the Bible word for turning around is repentance. Remember, repentance isn't, quote, feeling sorry for my sins. Feeling sorry won't get you anywhere on its own. 
But the scriptures say godly sorrow leads us to repentance. Leads us to what? To turn around, walk a different direction, go God's way. Some were fools in their rebellion, Psalm 107 says. They suffered for their sins. Their appetites were gone. Their death was near. Lord, help! They cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He spoke, and they were healed, snatched from the door of death. You see what happens? You turn around start walking the other direction. You're already walking in the direction of health then, but on top of that, you get the saving action and help of God. You want to talk about magnifying and multiplying the results of healthy decisions. Get God on your team by getting on God's team and going his way. He'll not only take the the blessings of just cause and effect of you making healthy decisions, he will add his blessing, additional levels and layers and degrees and qualities of life to you that magnifies the results and gets a whole lot of those uh, results in this life, not just in the next one. Going God's way or setting your mind on the Spirit means you're going to trust God's control instead of trying to control your life and the lives of others, okay? And we're talking about walking in, um, walking in league with the Spirit here, setting our minds on the Spirit. The Spirit wants to trust, and the Spirit wants to accept, and the Spirit wants to praise God, okay? Wants to trust Accept God's way. Trust God. Accept His ways. And praise Him. Instead of complaining all the time about how my life isn't going like I want, maybe God's forgotten me. Right? Now I trust that He's doing something even though I can't see it. There's an old song that says, when, I cannot, when you cannot see His hand, trust His heart. You believe God's good? Can't see what He's doing? He's doing something good that you can't see. That's trust. Accept. Accept that his ways are higher than mine. So the stuff that I can see that I ought to be doing, I do that. And in the meanwhile, I praise God that one of these days he's going to let me see the work of his hand and how it's been guiding and preparing a blessing for me. Jesus trusted God's control even when other people were rejecting him. So Peter, his buddy Peter, who watched him get whipped and watched him get crucified, said, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but, listen to this, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. While they were putting it to Jesus, instead of him thinking, you just wait until I come out of that grave. He's just saying, that's it. 10,000 angels. Now, this deal's over. He just kept giving himself to the Father. I I told you earlier, I don't want this, but I've chosen your way because I trust you. In this moment, it doesn't feel good, so I give myself to you again. I trust that you're going to do what's just. I trust that you're going to do what's right. I trust that you're going to make this redemption plan work. Jesus, while they were killing him, kept giving himself to the Father. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. He didn't judge them while they're doing that stuff to him. And he accepted himself. Get this. Jesus accepted himself for 33 years in subordination to the Father. For all of eternity past, he had been his equal. He accepted his position in this world under the Father. He said, I only do what the Father tells me. I only speak what the Father says. I don't want to be crucified. But Abba says, okay, I submit. He didn't judge. And he accepted himself as he was and got good with it. You think maybe you could get good with your place in this world? If Jesus got good, he was literally God and said, I won't hang on to it. You think maybe you could, you think maybe with the help of the Spirit and the love of my friends, Cliff Purcell could get good with having big ears? Or being pretty emotional? When I wish I could just be that strong guy? You think with the Lord's help and your love and support that I might be able to get good with, you know, being able to hear deer better than other people in the woods? and and with tearing up every time anything good or bad happens, you think I could, 
I could come to. I bet, I bet with the Lord's help and your love, I could. I could accept me for who I am. Hmm. Help of the Spirit and the help of my brothers and sisters. He didn't seek the praise of men. Philippians 2, 6, and 7. Though he's God, he didn't demand and cling to his rights as God. You set your mind on the Spirit, it means that you're going to accept yourself and you're going to accept others. So you won't be judging you or others. won't be comparing yourself to others. won't be envying other people, their position, their abilities, their looks, and their possessions. When you set your mind on God, you'll end up giving Him praise instead of looking at other people and giving them praise and criticizing yourself. And as a result, you're going to come to experience health and freedom and renewal. You're going to experience some other things too. In Galatians, Paul said, here's what the the life according to the flesh is. Here's what the life according to the Spirit is. And he said, you'll experience things like health and freedom and renewal. You'll experience purity. You'll experience self-control. You'll experience restoration. You won't be doing destructive things to your body because you won't be looking for love and acceptance in the wrong places and in the habits and behaviors that will destroy you. Listen what happens when you focus your mind on the Spirit. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Galatians 5, 1. So Christ has really set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. That sounds... Free sounds better than jail every single day. Knowing God leads to self-control, 2 Peter. Self-control leads to patient endurance, and patient endurance leads to godliness. I want to be godly. He doesn't snap his fingers and make you godly. He says, practice self-control by the help of the Spirit. Self-control will help you be patient while he does other things that makes you godly. Your focus, if you set your mind on the Spirit, If you set your mind on life, your focus will be on your dependence upon God and your hope in Him and the fact that one day you're going to get a new body, a resurrected one, that gets to function in a new world that is never going to be corrupted like this one. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. It's the same way for the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies which die and decay will be different when they're resurrected for they will never die. So here's the thing. We've got this human being, spirit, soul, and body. The soul chooses a mindset because its its will has been brought back to life by the spirit. With the help of God, you can choose how you think. And how you think is going to affect an awful lot of things. It's going to affect your emotions. It's either going to, how you think will either bring more confusion, or you can think about whatever is true, lovely, all those things from Philippians, and you'll start to get a clarity of, of mind instead of confusion, and you will find that it also then has effects upon your body. If you set your mind on the flesh, you are going to keep trying to control yourself and others, you're going to keep judging yourself and others, and you're going to keep trying to seek praise from other people so that you might get enough of it for you to believe that you're actually a decent human. And all of that is going to wear you out because it is stress and more stress and more stress. And you are going to fill up that capacitor to the place that it blows the gate open. And then all of that electrochemical energy that hasn't been healthily released from your body is going to be, unfortunately, unleashed to bring disease to various organs of your body. And you will experience illness or, and disease. And if you don't, if, if for some reason the capacitor doesn't attack your physical well-being, there's something that affects your will and you will start to abuse you. That's broken. That's broken. Either the gate comes open and you get disease or the gate gets stuck shut and you go, we got to take the lid off this thing somehow and you start doing abusive things to yourself. Those things bring death. But if you set your mind on the truth and you set your mind on the spirit and you decide to trust God and you decide to accept his way, and you decide to give him praise even when you can't see how he's working, you are going to find that you are going to experience health and freedom and renewal. Oh, renewal. 
We've got a bunch of women who are getting ready to go on a retreat. You know what they're hoping is going to happen while they're there? Beth, I know what you want for those ladies. You want them to be renewed. This year has been hard on our ladies. And there's just been a bunch of stuff that was beyond their control. And Beth and her team are just going to organize a weekend where people can go let the stress out in good, healthy ways, cry some of it out, laugh some of it out, walk some of it out, praise some of it out, and they're going to come home. You'll see them. They'll look different when they come home because there'll be a light on their faces that's coming from the inside. They're going, to, they're going to experience renewal. The week after that, a bunch of us guys are going to go away to man camp. We're going to get the, the masculine version of that. And you'll see it in us when we come back home. We won't be nearly so cranky. We won't be nearly so hard to get along with. We won't be nearly so stubborn because we'll have had our inner men renewed. So, you see, he hasn't left our bodies bound over to decay and death. Oh, it's one day physical death is going to happen. But between now and then, we have some impact on how we experience life, either in healthy, in increasingly healthy or less healthy ways. But then even when death, physical death, eventually gets us, he's going to give us a new body. He's going to pull the old one out of the grave, and then he's going to glorify it and give us a new one and a new world for it to work in. Between now and then, you get to choose a little bit better life. You have to set your mind on the Spirit. Lord, would you help us to? Because we believe lies. The enemy, he's, he's sneaky. He tries to sound like you a lot. But he makes empty promises and he makes accusations and they tear us down. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to set our minds on the Spirit. Set our minds on your holy word so that we recognize the lies of the enemy. Lord, would you stack the deck for us again? You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us your holy word. But if we don't set our mind on those things, if you don't help us set our minds on on those things. We're just going to be sucker punched by the enemy again and again. What I want for my brothers and sisters and for me is what I know you desire for us. Life and health and peace and freedom and renewal. So how about this? Would you just help us tonight as we lay our, our heads on our pillows tonight? Would you give us the wisdom to, three, to, to just do this little exercise of thinking three positive thoughts just get our minds in league with your spirit. And would you help us tomorrow morning to do it as we start the day? Lord, Lord, if we had just one good night's sleep and one day where we got to experience what it's like setting our minds on you, it might convince us to do it forever. So would you just tutor us a little bit, help us to do it tonight as we go to sleep, tomorrow as we wake up. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for your time. We'll see you on Sunday.